This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. The following episode of Charlotte, a City of International Success is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Maha Gingrich. Coming up on Charlotte, a City of International Success, I will interview Mr. Wayne Cooper, and he is the Honorary Council of Mexico. And we're going to talk about what it takes to help Mexicans who are in the Charlotte region. Stay with us. Welcome to Charlotte, a city of international success. I'm Dr. Maha Gingrich. Today our guest is Mr. Wayne Cooper, and he is the Honorary Council of Mexico. Welcome to our show, Mr. Cooper. Thank you for very much for having me. It is such a pleasure to have you because every place I go in the international community, you're there. I don't know how you do it, <laughs> but you're there, always serving. I have a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> oh, well, that's what I know the reality that you don't because you serve so much in the community. And it's really a pleasure and honor to have, and you have so much experience. I'm going to do my best to at least capture a fraction of your life story today. And to begin with, uh, you were born in Oklahoma? In western Oklahoma, out in the flatland, wheatland, on a poor dirt farm. Oh, wow. That, that's Many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of exciting. So is it, you said farmland? Yes, it was a 160-acre uh, wheat farm and wow. a few cows, uh, cattle there. Do you have your whole family that basically are farmers, like your father, mother, your uh, siblings? Not a one of us went back into farming. We, when we got off that poor dirt farm, we ran as far away as we can. I'm the only one now. We have about uh, 800 acres, and we're now raising goats. We have a goat ranch down oh. in Gaffney, and so we play, you know, play back on the farm. But I swore when I left that farm, I'd never go You're back. You're not going to be a farmer <laughs> again, but uh, for a good reason, probably. Um, now, when you were born, you know, th there, Obviously, you were living in the farm, right? And then you had to do the farm work. Now, did you have siblings? Had uh, five, uh, five, uh, one sister and five uh, brothers. And uh, we, uh, you know, my mother died when I was two. And so it was oh, very, wow. very difficult. Uh, my dad raised all six of us. And uh, it was, uh, it was it was it was rough. I, I've seen some of your programs, and everybody says they came from a humble beginning. Uh, mine wasn't humble; it was poor, <laughs> and, poor. and the whole area was poor because we had a dust uh, drought in the '48 to '52, and the crops weren't there, and there was no safety net in those days for for people. And so, I started school when I was four years old, mm -hmm. uh, across a one-room schoolhouse across the road from us with uh, outhouses and no running water and uh, but that was wow. you know maybe it made me a little stronger. I think so so you know some people say that yeah you know I was poor mm -hmm. but you're saying you felt the poverty. Yes. Because uh, lack of food and facilities. Well and yes and just you know we uh, the clothes and not able not didn't have a wash machine uh, I had an old ringer type wash machine I think that my dad did uh, the laundry on but yeah we did but you know it's okay all of my siblings were very uh, became very very successful and much more than what little success I've had <laughs> well I think it's um, an experience because when you take your experience and turn it into success you know, uh, that's why I'm excited to talk <laughs> to you. So you finished, um, you, did you do your high school? High school in town. We, they closed the one room schoolhouse uh, uh, after uh, the first year in the second grade. Uh, they just, I went into p town and, uh, and on a school bus uh, every day and graduated from, from a little town called Hennessy High School. Really, usually um, when you, own a farm like this, you yeah. know, with the parents. Um, your father, obviously you 
you come back from school and did you have to work in the farm then? Because oh, yes. somebody has to do mm -hmm. the job. Yes, and we all did and it was neat that, uh, I mean, our school, I remember our school when during planning time, uh, they recognized that we were not able to be in school during that when we had to help with the uh, sowing of the wheat and things like that. And Oh, yeah, so the school was actually sensitive. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah. So the school understood the concept of students actually being going, you know, or helping their parents or family yeah. to work on the farm. Yes, we all, and we all did. Wow, <laughs> yeah. wow. So after that, when you finish your high school, now I'm just questioning because obviously you're poor, there are no financial resources. Uh, so did you go to college? No, and I've always been embarrassed about that my entire life, and that's kind of why my wife and I, Judy, have uh, tried to help as many kids as we can, and because I've always had a, a problem with that of not being able to go to school and not having the education that a well, lot of people have. There are different ways of <laughs> educating oneself, you know, and what you have is uh, life experiences. Um, sometimes uh, there are things we learn in college and school, sometimes there are things that we learn in life. And I think that's where you were coming from with all those experiences. So um, the, did you then, you had to take a job, you had to do yeah. something, right, when you finished yes, your high and, school? Yes, and worked in the oil field, opened up in our little town of Hennessy, and it was an oil boom, and I worked in the, in the oil fields there, uh, doing everything, managed a, a trucking company that did a lot of the fracking of, uh, that we hear so much about and, and ended up making great contacts and ended up uh, working in, in Austin, Texas then for a while. Worked with uh, a man that was chief of staff to President Johnson and, uh, oh. uh, and uh, Walter Jenkins and worked for him. I didn't work in the political area. And then Sam Johnson, the President Johnson's uh, nephew and I become good friends and and one weekend we decided to go to Mexico. Mexico? And, and I'd never, you know, I, <laughs> I graduated from high school and never met a Latino in all the years in, in high school and so I just, I said sure, you know, it's only two and a half hours I think from, from Austin but yeah. we didn't stop there. We ended up, we were young and we ended up in Acapulco, which was 12 hours away, and so we ended wow. up down there. And uh, so, for no reason, you just wanted to explore, or did you actually well, yeah, have you know, something when you're, there? When you're young and, and adventurous, and Sam yeah. had been all over the world, and uh, and I had never been at, uh, hardly out of Oklahoma. Uh, uh, very few times and so all of a sudden I saw people speaking a different language and a different culture and I just fell in love with it and I stayed. I, uh, you know, came back and then it was just a few months till I ended up and moved to Mexico City. Obviously that probably was a incredible experience because you've been living in the United States and you said you haven't had any interaction with any international population yeah. where you were. And then you actually move to a country, mm -hmm. right? And then you s actually live in that country? Is and that what you did? You just moved and, and just I stayed, stayed there, there for eight, some time? Eight years. Eight years. See, what, what, my, what, what is neat about being poor, and I didn't have anything to lose. I didn't have a thing ah. to lose by taking a chance. And it's sort of my whole life that has been the, the case. Is all I have to do is look back to where I come from and think, what can be worse than that? Uh, you know, and I mean, not that it was bad, but it was, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, any from there, anywhere is up. <laughs> and so therefore I could take a chance and move to Mexico and, and stayed there eight years. Okay, so you were not afraid because you already saw mm -hmm. what it is to live a life mm -hmm. that you don't have many things to mm -hmm. enjoy. And so you just took a chance and went there. So what did you do there when you went? I, I did anything to stay away from <laughs> that poor dirt farm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did. I worked with XM Bank for a while representing uh, them. I, I ended up uh, being the uh, press attaché to the Ethiopian Embassy. Oh, wow. Which was the most fascinating thing of, of working uh, yeah. for the government of Ethiopia there for the ambassador. And he and I become very, very close friends. And I was able to take him uh, back to 
Oklahoma and see my roots uh, wow, with the ambassador and uh, learned it again a, a third culture. Yeah. And during all that time was learning international business. What, you know, what clicked? How do these people get mm. their food or their products there? And how do they finance it? And, and it was just, and making contacts. You know, to, have an, to be an entrepreneur, the first thing you've got to have is contacts. Contact. And so I started making contacts within the government of Mexico. Wow. So that whole thing was really uh, pretty creative because um, you had to find out, it wasn't a book knowledge. Mm -hmm. You had to find out how you're going to succeed, mm -hmm. how you're going to make it happen. So after that, then what did you do? After eight years of being there? I, I moved you? to North Carolina and uh, we started a company to sell Mexico agricultural equipment. Mexico and one of my contacts, it was in the agriculture department of Mexico. And so Mexico was trying to become self-sufficient in, mm -hmm. in agriculture. And so moved here and we started, uh, you know, I worked for a little uh, a computer card company. And, and, but in the meantime, we were, I were working on selling Mexico agricultural equipment, and it became, uh, you know, sort of successful. Yes, made a living. So when you say selling agriculture equipment, you're not talking about you manufacturing anything. Were you no. like buying things I and was, then selling it to Mexico? Yes, it's mostly grain bins. Uh, okay. The round grain metal buildings that like hold silos. wheat and corn and silos, silos. is what we call them okay. the rest of the world. Right. <laughs> and we uh, started, I'd buy those and then sell them uh, to Mexico and we did a better job of representing them and everything than the companies that were manufacturing was and ended up, we were fortunate enough to be able to buy two of the companies that were supplying us. It became fairly successful. But in the meantime, we had, it hadn't all been roses, you know, in, in 80, 81, Mexico went through a economic period and we almost, uh, you know, went broke uh, because all oh. of our eggs was in Mexico. Oh, okay. And so then on a shoestring started expanding again and trying to survive in other countries. And we ended up, you know, building Green, bin, green silos in China and Saudi Arabia was a big market for us and, you know, Morocco and Philippines oh, wow. and, you know, all over the world uh, that we were able to do that. Started expanding instead of putting all your eggs in one basket that was a in big Mexico. Mistake. Well, you have learned from that experience. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> and almost went broke. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that, that. that's what it's all about. So how did you end up being honorary council of Mexico. I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to connect here. <laughs> well, so yeah, you're yeah, selling yeah, all you this know, equipment. It's sort of serendipitous. <laughs> it, was, it just, you know, a it seems man. like everything happens for the, you know, for the for right good. reasons, yes. I think. And uh, I met with uh, President Lopez Portillo, who, who was president of Mexico in 1979. And I, I, he said, is there anything we can do? And I said, for you? And I said, be, I'd love to be the honorary consul of Mexico in North Carolina. Wow. And there was a big pause. <laughs> and, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not sure what I was asking for. And he said, do we have any Mexicans in North Carolina? <laughs> And I said, no, Mr. President. I this said, was 1979. 79. We only had about 20 families here 20 in, in families. Charlotte, oh, and we had tobacco goodness. workers down east. <laughs> and uh, and because of that, the United States government wouldn't approve it. And because be you didn't have enough Mexicans. Yeah, in we had no North justification Carolina. for oh, it. Wow. And then finally, a friend of mine was having lunch with uh, Alexander Haig, who was Secretary of State under uh, Ronald Reagan, ah. and in '81. And he told him about that, and he says, I think I can fix that. And, you know, and just a few weeks later, uh, I was named the Honorary Consul of Mexico under Hugo Morgan, who was our ambassador at that time in Washington. Wow, this is back in 1981. 81, so we've been the consul 33 years now. So my question, you know, I was going to ask yeah. you more details later, but having you know uh, the only honorary council in Me of Mexico I I'm thinking um, there was nothing in Atlanta and this region right we had Atlanta or and Washington I was the only thing between the two yeah. con uh, Atlanta and okay. Washington I was the only consul so wow. when and by then <clears throat> we started getting a bigger influx 
uh, of the construction industry started booming here. Mexicans started moving in here. We had worked successfully on getting uh, North Carolina to recognize driver's license for the undocumented. Wow. And that created a, a, a large draw. And then Bank of America started building and they brought in a contractor from Texas who employed a lot of the Mexicans and they stayed and because uh, they loved North Carolina and they had driver's license and they stayed, built their families. And so, but in the meantime, our workload increased tremendously. That's what and, I would think. When, when yeah. you say our, did you have employees or working yes, with you? Yes, uh, my employees for the agricultural equipment. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Agriculture. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I hired and them, and they, in, you know, they all spoke. We, I would never hire anybody that didn't have at least one second language, and uh, and so all of our people uh, spoke Spanish, and oh. uh, they handled all of that. But during the first amnesty program under Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. we handled all of those passports because before oh. they could get a green card, immigration would send them over to our office. For passports, so we had every morning go to work, and there'd be a long line of people. That, but we did the prison visits, we did hospital visits, we shipped bodies back, we did, you know, we did everything wow. a full consul would do for, you know, many many years until uh, uh, 2000, I think. I think a lot of people don't know what uh, honorary consul would do. Uh. You mm -hmm. know, so can you uh, explain yeah. to me, I understand wh where you're coming from. Yeah. When you started, there's really nobody around the area, so you did everything. Mm -hmm. Is it a norm now, or is it if you have like a general counsel, yeah. you know, how does that work? My title is I represent the government of Mexico okay. to the United States with my territory being the Charlotte region. South Carolina was not, South Carolina, uh, according to the State Department, was, was in a, uh, Atlanta's district. But yet, when we would have problems, and we'd had a lot of problems in, in South Carolina, and we would call the Consul General and, and, and ask for permission to handle that particular case. We were, at, we were not usual what we did. Uh, most honorary consuls do not have that workload. They, they rely on their consuls and consul generals, the career officers, to do that. Uh, we didn't have that luxury. And, and when somebody would walk in the door and had a problem, how do you say, no, we're only an honorary consul, we right. can't help you. Right. You know, we took it, you know, and we, again, working on the driver's license issues, working on social security, working on uh, uh, worker comp cases, uh, we did all of that. And uh, yeah. and then, we, of course, in the meantime, I was petitioning Mexico that we needed help and because uh, it was just so outgrowing the workload. Yeah. And so finally in 2000, Mexico established a three-person office in Raleigh. And okay. that office now has been elevated to a consul general post and they have 40 full-time 40. 40 career officer. I was kidding, well, the consul three general. People, you had 40. <laughs> consul general uh, <laughs> Diaz de Leon, and, and I was kidding one day, and I said, you know what I mean, Mr. Consul General, it takes 40 people to do what I used to do for free. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> but we have the most you wonderful have consul now general there. Are 40 there. people to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, people need to understand then if they're traveling. Yes to Mexico, or if they're from there, they're traveling out here. Is that uh, the, your office, if they need some help? If, if they're they? Mexican, we look after any Mexican nationals that are here. Okay. But it, we didn't limit to that. At the time, we didn't have Guatemala or Honduras or Nicaragua. Uh, we didn't have other, uh, and so when they would get in trouble, we would contact their embassy and ask for, for if it was something we could do to help we would step in and, and try to assist them. Uh, Iran had a ship off the coast of, and had a sailor die, and mm. they offloaded this uh, sailor in the body in Wilmington. Mexi uh, uh, Iran has no diplomatic relations with the United States. Oh, wow. So Iran looked and saw that uh, Mexico did. So they contacted Mexico, and they contacted me, and we handled the shipping of the body. Whenever you ship a body across the international boundaries, it becomes uh, it's a lot of paperwork and a lot of regulations so that you don't wow. export a disease and things like that. So we handled that uh, 
particular case, which was kind of a, a very unusual for me. Wow, so you almost do everything and anything simply because mm -hmm. of your passion mm -hmm. to help people. Oh, yeah. See, because that, that's, what, that's what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. This wasn't your job, this wasn't your role, but you did it because of your passion to help people. We know Mexico changed my life. Mexico changed my life from, again, from that poor dirt farm. And I can never, ever in my lifetime ever repay Mexico for what they've done for me. And the Mexican people, of course. Well, I think you are definitely repaying and doing more. So, um, after you started this part, mm -hmm. and uh, I do know that in, when we were talking before the show, you said uh, on humanitarian grounds because you started seeing the Mexican population here and uh, their needs and you saw some dangers and then some issues. Can you talk a little bit about that? We started having and even to this day seeing a lot of our Mexican and Latinos robbed. Uh, you know, among our criminal element, a, a Latino walking down the street is sometimes called a walking ATM machine. Walking because they, ATM machine? Yes, because they know they, they can rob cash? them. They carry cash oh. and they can be robbed and the chances are they will not report it. And so they've become a victim. And it, at that time it was costing $55 to send a money back to Mexico to their families. Mm -hmm. uh, $55 to, sir, to send $300 back. Oh, wow. And so uh, Patrick Brown and Dennis Jones and and I uh, went together and figured out a way that we could send the money back to Mexico uh -huh. for eight dollars. And from it would, thirty five dollars, eight dollars? From fifty five dollars to eight dollars. Fifty five dollars to eight dollars. Oh well, yes, uh, some of the MBA folk looked at our our model and said, wait a minute, if the competition is fifty five, why don't you go at thirty nine ninety five and look think all the money you're making? And I'd say, wait a minute, it's not to make money, it's to help these people. And we figured out how we could do it for eight dollars. And, and it would be there in 10 seconds. And we got a patent on it, and we offered it to all the banks. We went to every major bank uh, and offered it free if they would take it, and not a one of them would, thank oh. God, uh, <laughs> in, in hindsight. And so we started the company ourselves doing that, and we were fortunate enough to then that GE and Western Union and MoneyGram and and Wells Fargo all tried to, to buy us then because okay. they kept running into our patent. And so, uh, we sold it to a company on the New York Stock Exchange called Ur Uranet. Wow. And, uh, now I know there is an, um, you have several initiatives like that. Mm -hmm. So all this came out of humanitarian, you know. Yeah, it was not done to make money. It wasn't I mean, God knows I needed it, but it, that was not the motivation. <laughs> exactly, because yeah. you knew the need and you mm -hmm. knew something has to be done. You knew the dangers mm -hmm. of uh, if it did not happen, what would happen to the Mexican community. So thinking about the same, in, in the same lines now, uh, what about, um, I know that you're very active even with Central Piedmont Community College. Oh yeah, my love. <laughs> <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about um, what do you do with us? Because I do know that you, I think you serve on President's Council? The President's Council with Dr. Zeiss and I serve on a couple other committees, international committees with yeah. Central Piedmont. And uh, we have sponsored children, uh, kids going to Central Piedmont. You're sponsoring kids well, going to paid, Central Piedmont. Yeah, I helped them you with their, their tuition, tuition? Uh -huh, on the undocumented uh, kids. Is yeah. that because you did not have college yeah. education? Yeah, yeah, no question. You about wanted that. to see other kids going yeah. to college. Is mm -hmm. that the reason you were? And the undocumented started? kids cannot accept scholarships. They have to pay out of state tuition. Uh, they don't have any place to turn to. Yeah. I wish you know, Judy. Is, uh, was a counselor at a large high school, 1,600 students high school, and her love is, of course, is the same as mine to try to help these children. And, you know, we wish we could help them all, but, yeah. but we have been fortunate enough to help kids from Peru, China. We ah. had uh, a young man that, uh, in fact, he still calls us his American parents, and we call him our Chinese son. Uh, Peru, I, you know, many countries that we have been fortunate enough, again, we can't help them all, but we try to help what we can. We work through foundations here in Charlotte. Well, well you know, you, you're making the difference one student, one person at yeah. a time. 
and uh, that one person is going to help many others and be successful. Final question uh, is when you have to do something like this, you know, honorary counsel, I would think you need to have not only passion, but also you need to commit that time, personal time, right? Well, I think, I think so, but Charlotte had been so welcoming. I, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be the chair of the North Carolina District Export Council and the chair of the Foreign Trade Zone for the Charlotte Regional Partnership, and, and they've welcomed me into the mist and let me, but of course, I'm, I'm the one that has all the volunteer time now, so uh, maybe that be, that's one of the benefits of being unemployed now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you have done so much work, and I know that uh, you um, met with many dignitaries, you know, the presidents of Mexico, as well as dignitaries here and abroad, and you received many, many awards, and I know that personally, uh -huh. you know, recently from uh, World Affairs Council of Charlotte. Yes. And, uh, you know, it is the service that you are, you know, the, the, you're giving to the community. And the community really appreciates what you're doing. Well, the World Affairs Council reaches out and it helps so many people that I've been fortunate enough to serve on the board of that. And uh, they do such a wonderful, there's so many organizations here that you wish you had time to volunteer for all of them because they're just wonderful international organizations. Well, yeah. that's because you have a wonderful heart, and thank you so much. And it is such an honor to have you in our community. We are very fortunate. And most of all, thank you for being on our show today. Thank you very, very much for ha having me, and uh, best of luck to you in Central Piedmont. Thank you, and thank you for watching Charlotte, a city of international success. I'm Dr. Maha Gingrich. Please join us again next time, right here on WTVI PBS Charlotte. Production of WTBI PBS Charlotte.